let's start. I mean, what is interpretation? I mean, everyone is talking about interpretation and, you know, I'm Austrian and we go to concerts a lot and everyone is talking about uh, how the interpret interpretation was and we're talking a lot about Beethoven inter interpretation during the last six months. But I mean, what does the term interpretation mean? I mean, usually people talk about interpretation when they mean performance. So how was the performance we just have heard or whatever. Uh, for many people, even the performance is not important, they just talk about the dress of the pianist or how dramatic the conductor is moving or how good whatever the, the concertmaster is looking or, or things like this. And but for me personally, as, as a professional musician, the term interpretation is very, very important because it's what we actually do. And uh, the roots of just the term interpretation are in interpres, Latin, which uh, was someone who was negotiating something. And it's, it's a compound word of inter and pretium, or pretium, as we say in Austria. And so inter, as you know, means in between, everything which is in between something. And uh, pretium is price, can be, it has many, many meanings. Usually it's price, uh, value. Uh, awards and so it's the original meaning was a price in between or a value in between and uh, interpretare which is the active form and interpretari which is the passive form in Latin means uh, as I said before negotiating something it also means uh, making a prophecy, which is, which is, is very, very important. And <clears throat> so, but the interpres in Rome, whatever, over 2000 years ago, he was some, someone who was negotiating something. And later it became in English, interpreter is the same word for translator and performer. In What's very interesting in Spanish, it's interprete, which is translator, performer, and guide. Uh, so there is in Spanish a third additional meaning in this in this um, uh, in this word. And in German, we have two different so so übersetzer and interpret. So for a translator and for interpreter are two different two different meanings. So but I mean it shows already what an interpreter or interpretation is. So we are translating something or we're presenting something or we're negotiating something. So it's someone needs us to explain some something. And I mean, interpretation started the moment where music was written down. And you know how, maybe a little bit the his history of, of music notation. What I found recently was a very interesting book, and it's called the Oxford, um, the Oxford Encyclopedia of the History of Mathematics by a mathematician, a ma mathematician called Luke Hodgkin and he explained and it's a really a fantastic book and also for musicians because I mean, mathematics and music are, you know, have many, many things in common and that from the old or ancient Egypt we only have sacred and uh, legal texts so what from the, the old uh, Egyptian empires we, we have uh, is either texts from priests or from rulers. And uh, a couple of thousand years later in Mesopotamia, 
when you know this Sumerian Empire started, there was the first what we nowadays call a written handwriting. Uh, so, which is really using symbols for for communication, and uh, it's called cuneiform or cuneiform, and it's this you know these kind of wedges which are going into different directions, and the these uh, symbols were used because it was impossible to memorize information anymore. And, but the information was usually a business, uh, you know, how much someone sold to someone, how much, uh, you know, you have earned from someone and, and all these things. So, um, writing and mathematical symbols started when it was too difficult to memorize something anymore. Mm -hmm. And I have here a, a quote from, maybe you know him, from Isidore de Sevilla, who said, uh, sorry, someone is, has not muted his, his microphone. Can you please mute your microphone? So, so I, have, I have a lot of noise on my, on my speaker. Thanks. Um, so in the 7th century, Isidore de Sevilla, who was an, an archbishop in Sevilla, said that unless sounds are held by the memory of man, they perish because they cannot be written down. And what I also did not know, but what my Spanish colleagues me told me, that uh, uh, neumes, so what we in German call Neumann, you know, those are these little symbols which have been put on top or below uh, words, just to uh, uh, to show the direction where the music is going. It's also, I mean, the old ancient Greeks already started started using. But this was used for the first time in Spain in the seventh century, and it was called. Sorry. Uh, it was called. Visigothic neumes. So the Visigoths are, you know, the people from Central Europe. In German, we call them Westgoten, who then went to Spain and southern France and and built built the empire there. And later, you know, probably in the end of the first millennium, Guido d'Arezzo. He was the first who was using staff notation, which is in more or less the same way we are um, notating music nowadays. And okay, but I mean interpretation started already or starts in the, the moment when we write down music. Because music is so complex and it has so much information that um, we just can write down the minimum of what can be uh, can be performed. And that's why culture has become so important because you have to know at some point, uh, or you need information at some point which you not can get from another source than the place you have been educated. At. So, for instance, speaking about Austrians and about Vienna and, and so on, uh, there's a lot of the way how you so uh, produce sound, how you uh, make music, which you learn very often from a very early age onwards, uh, unconsciously, and which then becomes part of the way you make music. And, but which has nothing to do with what actually is written in the score. The problems start when the way we make music now and the way music was made, let's say, 200 years ago at Beethoven's time, has become so different that we do not have an intuitive 
feeling for it and that we actually did not grow into this kind of, of music making. And that's what I would like to, to explain a little bit in, in, um, during the next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, because interpretation and music making has many, many, many parameters. And I would like to start with the not most obvious parameter, that's the audience. So an audience has an enormous influence on the quality of an interpretation. And I had a very interesting uh, experience when I was assistant conductor many, many years ago in, in Hamburg with the uh, NDR Symphony Orchestra, so the North German Radio Symphony Orchestra. They just returned from a tour with Lorraine Marcel. They played in London, in Paris, Madrid, Italy and so on. And the musicians said that Marcel conducted differently every, at every concert. So the tempi were different, uh, his emotions were different, his phrasing was different. So in Madrid he conducted completely differently than in London and so on. And I experienced this as well with him. So I heard him many times in London, I heard him many times in Vienna with the Vienna Philharmonic. And also the same works. And in London he conducted completely differently from, from Vienna. And so the place where you make music and the people you make music for I, a very important part of interpretation is because it affects what you do and of course we make music for people so we just not stand, stand on the podium and play for people so we really want to involve people so audience and the next level the concert hall is very very important and the concert hall is like an instrument so a good concert hall, like you know, Konzerchebau, Musikverein in Vienna, uh, Boston Symphony Hall, some fantastic modern concert halls in, in England, you know, Manchester, Liverpool. Uh, they, are, they have a life of their own and they have a character of their own and they have a charisma of their own. And when an orchestra plays a long time in a certain concert hall, like the Viennese Orchestra, in the Musikverein or like Boston Symphony in, in, in Boston, then this becomes some sort of a symbiosis and the character of the hall becomes an integral part of how the, the music, musicians experience music and how, how they project music. So the concert hall is very, very, very important. And there also we come already to the, the question um, between, uh, I mean, the, the difference between live performance and recordings because there are so many qualities and parameters which you do not experience on the recording and the concert hall becomes much 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 more important uh, at a live experience than on the, on the recording I mean you hear with the Vienna Philharmonic when they recorded the Musikverein that it's the Musikverein and it sounds different from when they recorded at the you know, Sophienseele or at the Konzerthaus or wherever but you really hear on the recording the sound of a hall when you know it, but the live experience is, is completely different and, and I would like to get back to that a little bit later. Then, um, don't, don't laugh, but uh, temperature, humidity, because we're dealing with instruments made of wood, just look at a violin, so in winter, in Austria, when it's dry, it's completely different than in London, when it's very humid, completely different from here in Spain. At the sea, where you have humidity with salt, uh, when you play in Morocco, it's probably going to be completely different as well. So the, the, the weather and the temperatures have an enormous impact on, on how you perform. Also with pianos, so uh, you know pianos are very very temperature sensitive, mm -hmm. and they uh, especially humidity can uh, imp imp impact the sound of a piano enorm enormously. And okay, and then we have many many other things where we now get into what usually is 
talked about in interpretation. So this is the size of the orchestra, it's the tradition of the orchestra. So when I conduct Beethoven in London or with people in Austria, it's completely different because it's you're dealing with a completely different tradition of music making with different feeling, with different uh, priorities. So in England, the priorities are very much in uh, playing, uh, in projecting a very clean, well-defined sound. Um, in Austria, it's more like uh, it's about the character of the sound. It's not so much the beauty of the sound, but it's more the character of the sound, and it's more about colors. And in Germany, it's completely dif dif different again. And okay, so we have traditions of orchestra, then we have tempo, which is also dependent on size of orchestra, size of hall, many, 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 many different things. And then we get into the details, which are for me very, very important. So articulation, phrasing, agogic. I mean, uh, 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 you probably know what agogic is. So agogic is uh, the uh, tempo changes which you make within a phrase, very, very important, you know, so because it's also part of certain styles. And um, it's also, uh, I mean, the, the, the color of the instruments which you're using. So when you're using an A clarinet, it's completely different from a B clarinet or from a C clarinet. It's very much about balance. So if you have a large string section, maybe you will have to double the wind section, which I sometimes find a very good idea. If you have very strong string players and you just play with, uh, you know, two flutes, two oboes, two uh, bassoons, two clarinets, it might be that in the tutis, in the, tutis uh, the wind section has to, has to push too much. So sometimes doubling the wind section is a very, very good idea. Then we have, uh, talking about wind section, we have tuning. So there are so many different ways of tuning. So, I mean, you know, I worked a lot with period instruments. So sometimes we played on 4.15. Usually play, you play with period instruments on 4.35. I did a Roika on the period orchestra in Austria couple of years ago on 4.35. Then you do it, I did it a couple of years later in Austria as well. On modern instruments, then you played on 4.42. When I was my uh, assistant with the Vienna Philharmonic, at my first recording, uh, that was the Mary Widow with John Elliott Gardiner for Deutsche Grammophon, the Vienna Philharmonic was playing on 4.47. Yeah, I think they have. <laughs> I think they have changed it in, in the meantime. That was over over twenty years ago. Um, but you know, there's a huge range of uh, just colors which you get from a different um, uh, tuning and tuning system, of course. And all the things. Also, you have to think. For instance, I did very often modern strings and modern woodwind, woodwinds with uh, period horns and natural trumpets and then you have to think about how far can you go with the period instruments in terms of tuning are you playing on 442 should you play on 440 if you're playing too low it's not good for the strings and, and all these things so those are also very very important param par parameters you have, you have to think about and okay and, but that's just the things which are important for us musicians. Hmm? So those are the parameters which we musicians think about. But I mean, there are very, very few people in the audience who think about this. And I mean, I believe they should not, because that's not what music is about, because music is an experience. And it's our job as musicians to present the best possible experience for, 
um, for the audience, which also means uh, not playing mistakes. So I mean, for me, a mistake is not is not a, is not a strategy. But if you play too many mistakes, it could be hard to follow the music. It not making mistakes is also that you show that you care for what you're doing. It's a little bit like what we uh, nowadays we have the the word, the word mindfulness. You know, it's it's very. It's a very uh, popular expression, and not making mistakes in music is some sort of mindfulness because I mean you just make sure that whatever you do, you put as much uh, focus and as, as much uh, as much of, of your own consciousness in, into it. And of course, for me. Producing a beautiful sound is also important because a beautiful sound is uh, something which invites you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't want to. I mean, you have you know I have conducted many different countries, many different traditions, and so on. And when I, when I come back to Austria, and I give the upbeat for, for the first for the first bar, and it's just there's some sort of sound which I immediately recognize, so I'm at home, yeah? And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's more beautiful than in Germany or in England or where else. It's just, that it's a certain way of producing a sound, which I personally very often find very inviting. So I like listening to Austrian orchestras and the sound is, I mean, you know, I'm from Graz, so, but even Graz, they play sort of, it's a very Austrian character, you know, so, but it's, it's very inviting, so, and I mean, it's the same with the orchestra, like Konzerhibau Orchestra in Amsterdam, I mean, it's a very, very beautiful, very free, very colorful sound, so, uh, I mean, I just like that, you know, because it invites you to listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays, I mean, in the early days of period performance, uh, some of the performances have been quite rough. You know? But nowadays, uh, the period players have become so good that also on period instruments, the sound production is so interesting and so colorful and so warm yeah, that so even period instruments are now very, very, uh, uh, period instrument performances are very, very inviting inviting performances. No? Okay, so let's just go back to NLBS, first performance of Eroica and uh, Beethoven 5, huge concerts, four hour concerts, whatever, one rehearsal, just imagine one rehearsal, mm. and I mean you know this story at the, this famous concert with Beethoven 5, 6 and so on, Beethoven in the choral fantasy, he told the orchestra not to play a repeat at the concert, he played the repeat and they had to start it again and all these things. And I'm just thinking, I mean, how was it at that time? So, I mean, I'm sure that the musicians were absolutely fantastic. So Beethoven played incredibly piano, I'm 100% sure. The instruments were probably good, maybe not Stanway, but I mean, you know, a Walter Flügel, uh, Walter concert piano and so on, those are very, very good instruments. And, uh, but there was the genius of Beethoven, this charisma, and he was like a movie star, he was like Steven Spielberg at that time. And people did not have a television, there was no recording, and uh, I'm sure that they played very much in tempo, because there was no way of con uh, there was n no way of conducting we know nowadays. Yeah? So the only way of keeping everything together was just keeping a certain pulse. Yeah? Just imagine Beethoven fourth piano concerto without conductor, with one rehearsal, completely new piece. So you have to keep a certain pulse because otherwise it's going to be complete complete chaos. 
but also imagine that uh, because I did um, last year Mozart Grand Bandita uh, with some musicians from, from Valencia, very, very good musicians, and I was getting a little bit into the history of wind music in Vienna in the 18th, late 18th and, and early 19th uh, century. And what I found was that everyone was playing, uh, was having a, a wind band. So the emperor had a wind band, all the aristocrats had wind bands, they had wind ensembles, quintets, sextets, septets, whatever. But it was also in the restaurants, in the pubs, it was in every street corner, they were playing music on wind instruments and wind ensembles and wind bands, you know. They were playing music by Mozart, Figaro, whatever, Salieri, etc. So it was like radio nowadays, but real, real people playing music all the time. So you went to a pub in Vienna and five people, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, horn, flute, whatever, they were playing excerpts from Figaro. Hmm? They were just standing there. And it was, this is so much more inspiring than listening to a, uh, sorry, sterile radio or Spotify, sorry Spotify, but, but, but whatever. And there probably was a lot more of bacteria, lot, lots more, many, many viruses, of course. So life was not as healthy and as safe as it is now. But there was an extremely inspiring atmosphere. You know? And in this kind of atmosphere, great creativity bloomed at a certain period, especially between 1770 till in Vienna, yeah, till Mahler, Schoenberg, and, and so on. And so you have this kind of atmosphere, which is life, which is not recorded, which is life, which inspires you to be creative. And this is very, very important for me when I make music, because that's how they felt music at that time. So it was not a sterile recording and we put on the headphones and then we listened to Eroica and uh, uh, expect that everything is completely perfect. But it was something completely different. Different. It was a way of communicating. And when we go back to you know Leopold Mozart's very very famous violin school, and I have a a, a quote a quote from it here. Uh, so for me, the, the most important quote from from the violin school from Mozart's dad is that he writes that. Uh, music has to be like poetry. So you have to uh, present music as if it would be poetry. And we're talking about 1755. He wrote it, I think, he, he wrote it one year before Mozart was born, before Wolfgang was born. So we're talking about 1755. So music has to be presented as it were poetry. So it's not just something we consume. It's not a, a, a product. It's something which is communicated to us in a very, very lively, colorful uh, way, which affects our, our everyday lives. And that's where we come to what, for me, in interpretation is, is very, very important is that it has to touch me at some level. So I don't mind if you play a Roika much, much slower than the metronome markings of Beethoven. So I've heard a Roika with people like Lovro von Matacic many, many years ago, 40 years ago, was much, much slower than, let's say, Roger Dorrington. And, but it touched me in such a way because it was so well played and so honest and the character of the music was so strong that every note touched me. And then we come, I think, to the term character. 
which is for me in the in interpretation also, also very very important. Okay? Uh, so when uh, a good interpretation for me is an interpretation which shows to me character, character of music, character of phrasing, character of 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 certain. Um, uh, ways of presenting the music, character of the interpreters, of the conductor, whatever. So character and, in the end, personality is also something which, for me, uh, affects the, the, the experience of, of music very, very, very strongly. And <clears throat> don't forget that a concert and an opera performance is, is a very, very strong ritual. Mm -hmm. So we do not experience it as strongly anymore because there are so many uh, information just flashing at us all the time. But just imagine 100 years ago, 120 years ago, uh, going to an opera performance was one of the greatest experiences people had. Or don't forget when Bach was performing his cantatas, in, uh, in Leipzig, in the, in the Thomaskirche. So, the Sunday service was the biggest show in town. There was nothing else. So, the performance of Bach cantatas on Sunday was something which probably nowadays is the finals of the Champions League or uh, I don't know, A ATP, tennis, uh, uh, Wimbledon, Paris, or, or something like this. Yeah. And um, so the, this, this experience as a very, very important ritual uh, also affects interpretation because, I mean, if you as a, as a performer are aware that it's, it's a very important ritual, you perform completely differently. And, I mean, I never forget that whenever and wherever I conduct, and even if it's somewhere in Styria in a little village, it might be that for some people it's the first time, and very often it is the first time, that they hear a Roika or Jupiter Symphony or whatever live. So it's for many, many people very often the first live experience of a great piece piece of music so okay and that's for me also very very important part of interpretation okay good and now i'm just very briefly um for my students i mean we talked a lot about beethoven during the last month and about beethoven interpretation and um We have lost a little bit the innocence of just doing it. Hmm? So, and I don't mean just playing what is written. That's exactly what I don't like. So, but that the innocence of just doing and making music and forgetting any kind of interpretational anger. You know, you know what I mean. So, I mean, if you perform Beethoven nowadays, if you do not fit in a certain category, people are confused. Or maybe people who are uh, uh, used to to deal with Beethoven interpretations, are a little bit confused. But I think it's, it's very important that you try to find your own way of interpreting this music. This can, of course, be playing it exactly in the tempo markings Beethoven has, has given us. But that could also mean doing it completely differently. I mean, when, uh, when Christian Tillemann is doing Beethoven with the Vienna Philharmonic, the tempests are sometimes very slow, but it's very beautifully done. Very many, many beautiful details, uh, lots of atmosphere, lots of character, lots of personality. I just listened to a recording of the Pastoral Symphony, 
with Tillemann at the Vienna Philharmonic and it's just very beautifully played and there are many phrasings which were new for me which I liked very much and okay then on the other side you have people like Jordi Saval with his, his spirit instrument orchestras uh, which mainly consists of Spanish and French musicians and suddenly it's completely different yeah, it's very fast tempi, it's very rough you smell horses and hay and whatever so you, you smell in the music the smell of 200 years ago and it is probably more authentic than what Tillemann is doing and I like it very much as well so I, I love it because it's honest and it's direct and it's fantastic and um, but it's also a certain way of doing something so one of my students uh, Giotto he was calling it corporate identity so Jordi Saval has a very strong corporate identity and this is true so he has a certain way of doing things which is immediately recognizable but in this case I like the, his, his corporate identity I like, I like it very much but what, what I'm aiming at is that there are many musicians like uh, as I said before Herbert Blomstedt who do not fit into any kind of category. The other one uh, I like, for instance, is Marek Janowski, who is a Polish conductor who is working a lot in Germany, Switzerland, France. And he's like Blomstedt. He is looking for the best possible solution to an interpretational problem. And he's just doing it. And of course he knows a lot about historically informed performance, but he is judging it on his knowledge and on his intuition on music. And that's the way I personally prefer making music. You know? That you know as much as possible about the music you're performing. And for instance, if you do Mozart, if you do Purcell, if you do Bach, you have to know a lot about this music because it's very difficult. And also if you do Wagner, even if you do Mahler, there's a lot we very often don't know. And um, that you try to f uh, f learn as much as possible about the style and the way at this, in a certain period music uh, has been performed. But in the end, you make your own decisions and you make your own personal decisions. And if they are wrong, they are wrong. And if Beethoven is very angry with us in wherever he is now, then uh, we say, okay, Beethoven, sorry, that was, was my mistake. But you have to, you have to make your own mistakes. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, don't try to fit into any kind of uh, interpretational vision holding just because your agent can sell you much much easier with that so tr try to find your own own way of doing doing music okay and yeah okay I'm, I'm talking a lot so let's get to our last three points which is quality and because I love quality and one of the reasons why I live in Spain is because I love quality, because in Spain there is quality, especially in food. So I mean, you know, the Spanish cook fantastically and they have fantastic products. So when you go to the market, the farmer's market, I mean, you find vegetables and fruits, which is absolutely amazing. So for me, quality is something which is part of everyday life. And there is a cheesemaker just 10 kilometers from here in the mountains. And he produces a cheese which is absolutely extraordinary. Goat's cheese mostly. Goat's cheese, sheep's cheese. And, but outside of Alicante, the Comarca here, Aldea, no one knows anything about this cheese. Maybe people in Madrid know this cheese, maybe Barcelona, maybe. 
Uh, but in Vienna, in London, in Brazil, in Tokyo, no one knows anything about that cheese. And, but the quality is absolutely amazing. And then there are other cheeses, so I had an incredible experience when I was in Brazil, exactly one year ago. And you know, there's this uh, President, the um, uh, French uh, company, milk and cheese company. And I saw exactly the same cheese, which I see here at the supermarket, which I have seen in London in the super, supermarket, in Vienna, at the Carrefour in Brazil, in the north of Brazil, exactly the same cheese. And, okay, so the whole world, world knows this cheese. It's not the best cheese you can get. Hmm? But I, I think you, you know where I'm aiming at. Yeah? So with us musicians, there are many, many musicians, and I have met many musicians, who are just in their own region, in their own sometimes village where they are living. Uh, they produce incredible quality. We have also here in, 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 in Aldea, in our village, fantastic musicians. So one of the uh, ex-first clarinets from the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, he's Spanish, he lives here. So, but no one knows anything about it. And then there are musicians everyone knows everything about. And, but sometimes I have to say the quality is not, it's not even, you know, discussion about interpretation, it's just the quality is not always really the best. Mm -hmm. So, and what I recommend and what I believe in is that whatever you do, try to do it in the best possible quality all the time. So when I cook, I try to cook every day or every time I cook the best possible way with the best possible ingredients. And in music making it's the same. So wherever you are, Whatever you do, if you're famous, if you're just doing a concert for your friends in the living room, wherever you, you're making music, do it in the best possible way and do it also as an interpretation in the best possible way. And it might be that no one ever is going outside of this living room is ever going to know what, what you have played. Sorry, sorry, can you just mute yourself? Okay, thank you. And no one is ever going to know about it, but it's a fantastic experience for the people who were with you. And during the lockdown in Spain in March, May, June, I was playing a concert on the terrace on, on this piano every Sunday. And it was really a fantastic experience. You know? but maybe there were just 20 people listening or so. If, 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 if 20 people, but it was for me an incredibly satisfying experience. And I hope probably for the people who listen as well. So quality is something which is, should be part of your everyday life. And I'm ha absolutely convinced that when it's part of your everyday life, you will be able to produce, this, produce it in, a, in the, on a bigger scale. If you're working with the, you know, Berlin Philharmonic, whatever, you will be able to, to produce it as, as well. And now we are coming to the end. And I